Hello everyone, my name is Renuka, Assistant Professor in Department of Electronics and Communication Engineering, Maharaja Institute of Technology, Mysore. In previous class, we have uh, dealt about the different kinds of methodologies and how they were effective and the kind of evolution process. And we also uh, came to a conclusion as to uh, which is the most famous uh, methodology that could be adapted for real-time operating system. And uh, today we shall study one such methodology in detail with a simple example. Example uh, of uh, uh, drying uh, component or oven which is mainly used uh, for drying the components. Okay. So now, there are many similarities between uh, uh, Ward and Miller and uh, Hatley and Fitbein version of Jordan uh, methodology. Uh, let us take an example of a drying oven which is considered here to dry the components okay, that has been passed through an oven. So if you just see this diagram here, what you can see is there is an oven, this is an oven. Okay. Next you have, there are three heaters which are available. So one will be the preheater, other is the drying, used for the drying purpose, the other is for the cooling of the uh, component. Okay. And then you have, uh, this is a conveyor belt on which the components, there is a one single component that has been uh, highlighted here, which is moving on a conveyor belt. This is a conveyor belt and there will be a motor on either sides to make the components move on this conveyor belt and there are guards. If you see there are guard here on either side of the heater and accordingly you have an indicator at the start and the end. Okay. So we have uh, what is called as a thermocouples, three different ends of the heater. Okay. So now say that uh, it is a simple example of a drying oven which is mainly used to dry the components. Okay. So now let us try to understand uh, what are the ways in which you, ha you can actually uh, think about writing the methodology for one particular uh, uh, aspect of a plant to dry a simple component using a oven. Okay. So now an oven is heated. So if you consider this oven, the whole closure, okay, this cubicle. So now it is uh, heated by three uh, gas fired burners placed at the interval along the oven. So this is an oven. So you have uh, the burners will heat and uh, at the three different intervals of time in the oven so that the temperature is maintained throughout for a preheater drying as well as cooling specification as per the oven. Okay. Now, the temperature is monitored and controlled because it is very important that the preheating level and the drying and the cooling has a different temperature. So, hence it has to be monitored. right? So, the temperature is monitored and it will be controlled and then an operator console unit enables the operator to monitor and control the operation of the units which means that there will be a display unit at the near the operator wherein he can actually visually see uh, what is the temperature that has been maintained and what are the uh, heating level, what is the speed of the conveyor belt, all, all the important process control uh, elements will be monitored on a panel. So that will be called as a operator console. Unit enables the operator to monitor and control the operation of the entire unit. The system is presently controlled by a hardwired control system. So hardwired control system uh, is nothing but a simple uh, mechanism in which uh, a control system is uh, monitored, maintained by a finite state machine. Okay. So now we'll have to think about what do you mean by finite state machine. So uh, if I say that there are different states at which a machine uh, could uh, help, or you know, if I take a simple example here, uh, the vending machine. When if I take a vending machine, it is a finite state machine. Okay. What does a vending machine do? It actually uh, has uh, the coins. Okay. So when a person would like to take some uh, eatables or a drink, uh, you know, which is space, a soft drink probably, he has to have those many number of coins which has to be placed as a token. Correct. So that amount okay, will be uh, dispensed in a vending machine. Uh, the vending machine will facilitate in uh, obtaining a required 
uh, eatable or uh, a drink or a soft, a soft drink from a machine when you dispense it will be dispensed based on the amount that you're going to put as a token inside the machine correct because you don't have to monitor and uh, for a longer time you will really not have an operator there it can be done on its own right so it has uh, less amount of uh, maintenance cost and uh, wages that has to be paid for uh, multiple people will be reduced correct so a vending machine becomes one of the finite state machine got it so here in finite state machine the variables here are nothing but the coins okay the total coins that will be taken as a token okay and uh, usually the vending machine will have uh, the amount that will be divided by uh, say about uh, you know divided by 5 so it could be 5 rupees 10 15 so on right so that amount has to be uh, uh, entered as a token and you can dispense the required uh, uh, the soft drink or the eatable that you want from the vending machine that will be placed fine so this is about the finite state machine then other is called as a, um, a simple micro programmed uh, control machines uh, wherein uh, a simple uh, the entire mechanism is controlled by the memory uh, control uh, scheme wherein you have uh, some control uh, signals that will be sent to the memory and the, uh, the entire control has to be maintained and monitored so that is called as a micro program control machine so now here the entire system is hardwired so which means it is of the it is mainly maintained by the finite state machine right controlled by the finite state machine so the important uh, observation here is we always try to replace the hardwired control system uh, to with a computer based system so there is a major uh, uh, goal wherein you have to convert this hardwired uh, system into a uh, that our computer based system which will be very advantageous in operation because the maintenance will be very easy and monitoring and controlling would be also very efficient and reliable okay so now so how do we actually go ahead and try to venture how the computer based system could be adapted so first is a new computer based system is also to provide the links with the management computer over communication so the communication link between the systems is very important what kind of communication link that has to be established so that and also the distance and the kind of operation that will be used for okay so now uh, drying oven okay which is mainly to dry the components okay if that is taken as an example then uh, we have certain inputs and outputs in any of the plant so that has to be defined in any methodology right how do we define those input so we have to first call it as a plant input so input come from a plant interface cubicle okay and from the operator so the two possibilities where you can get the inputs is from the operator who is going to operate that machine or it could be by the interfacing unit okay a thermocouple is provided in each heater area and heater areas are preheated then drying cooling and inputs are available as voltages in the range of 0 to 10 volts because we have we know about the hot air right because we are maintaining the temperature uh, based on the voltage being applied so here if you just see the diagram we have what is called as a thermocouple what is thermocouple it is nothing but temperature dependent voltages for example if i have to set a high voltage level I just vary the temperature which in turn replicates the uh, the, pre, uh, the amount of voltage from 0 volts to 10 volts if it is uh, in excess of 10 volts then there should be an alarm which should be set okay and that has to be monitored and that has to be monitored then and there right so the thermocouple is provided in a heater it is mainly to make sure that the temperature that is being maintained at the preheater level and at the drying level and the cooling level has to be optimum such that the voltage ranges between 0 to 10 volts which has to be predefined okay so a conveyor speed is measured by the pulse counting system and referred to as a con speed so conveyor speed is shortened as con speed so the the movement of the conveyor belt okay the conveyor belt is mainly based on the pulse 
So the number of pulse increases, which means the speed of the conveyor belt is very high. If it is low, then the number of pulses, which is you know, used for the conveyor to move along the motor, then it will be very low, right? So based on the number of pulses, you can uh, execute the speed or you can just control the speed of operation of the conveyor belt, okay? So there are three interlocking or interlocked safety guards on the conveyor belt. So if you just see in the diagram here, this is a conveyor belt, what you can see, correct? So there are guards here, right? There are guards here, okay? They are interlocked. Why do we have to have an interlock? A any conveyor belt will have an open end, correct? So what happens if you don't lock it correctly, there might be a chance of the, the components being dropped or it may not, if it has not been placed correctly, then it can spill over, correct? Or it might get caught or there might be a, uh, you know, there be a damage uh, uh, on the edges of the conveyor belt, okay? That's the reason to ensure that the component are safe on the conveyor belt, there has to be a three guarding system, okay? So there, you call it as an in guard and you have an out guard and a drop guard. What is the in guard? In guard and or you can simply say that in guard is when you have the components placed on the conveyor belt, okay, where, uh, along the motor length, okay, you have the motor and you have the conveyor belt, right? So that is uh, in guard and then you have the out guard where you are uh, dispensing the uh, component after the, it dries up, correct? And then you have the spill. So when you are trying to move that uh, component from uh, outside the uh, oven, so you are trying to move the component outside the oven onto a container. So that, that is what is referred to as in guard, out guard and drop guard. So they are set high to indicate that the guard are locked, placed and conveyor is running. So whenever the conveyor belt is on, it is running, you have to ensure that the belt is locked. So how do you ensure? If it is set to high, if it is low, which means the conveyor belts are not on it is not moving. So when all the three guards are set high, which means that the conveyor belt is running, okay, and there will be an indicator to say that now the conveyor belt is running. So it returns red. Heater controller. So next you have uh, once, so once you are done with the uh, conveyor belt, now you have to think about what kind of the plant output that you are going to consider. It's heater control. Each of the three heaters has control unit. So each of the heater here, what you see in the diagram has a control unit because you have to control what? The temperature, the voltage in turn has to be controlled, correct? And the speed of the belt has to be controlled, right? So all these aspects, so heater control, and so there'll be a heater controller for all the three heaters that has a control unit. So input to the control unit is a voltage of zero to 10 volts that corresponds to no heat output to maximum heat output. So no heat is when the voltage is zero and the maximum it could go for is about 10 volts. So that will be the set voltage levels. Conveyor startup. So if a signal convey, if a signal is being conveyed, start is the output conveyor motor control unit. So when there is a start, startup, it goes high, then you have the motor bin operated, okay? then the control unit will start working. And the second signal conveyor stop, if a conveyor says stop, then the output of the motor unit will stop. So it will stop the motor output, okay? So signal one will be for on, signal uh, uh, second will be for off. So motor on and off, that is your startup, okay? Next, log guard. Log guard causes the guard to be locked in position and turns on the red indicator light on the side of the unit. So if you just diagram here, you have the indicators on either sides, right? So what does it indicator? If these indicators are red, okay, then it means that the conveyor is on, the belt is on and it is moving. Then operator input. So what are the operator inputs? The possible operator input is what? It could either start, it could either stop, it can either reset or restart and even it could pause, okay? So if you just see who is the operator, the person who is operating the plant, right? He can just start the system, 
stop the system, pause the system and also he can restart and reset. What is the difference between restart and reset? Restart is the starting of the entire process again from the beginning. Then you are going to start the operation. That is called as a reset. Okay. If the, for example, if that, if there are any, uh, you know, uh, unknown, unseen uh, issues that happen uh, during the uh, process, then it can be paused or it is a temporary halt of the entire process. Okay. Then you have operator output. Operator output is nothing but the VDUs, that the visual display unit that are available, which talks about what is the amount of temperature that has been maintained, what is the speed of the belt, the conveyor belt and the alarm status, whether if there is any alarm, if the temperature is little higher than expected, then there should be an alarm, right? If it is too low, then there should be an alarm. If there is any malfunction, there should be an alarm. So all these are called as the operator outputs. So here when you talk about the plant, uh, plant output, you have heater controller, you have conveyor startup, then you have guard locks, and then you have the operator inputs as well as operator outputs. The coming to the functional specification. So if you just talk about the specification, you have to be more accurate about the functioning of the, the entire unit, fine. If 20% uh, of the set point is achieved, then the switched will be normal. So switching will be normal, okay. So which means that if you want to initially start the execution of the, the belt or if you want the uh, drying, uh, drying oven of the component to start working, then what are the initial setup that you have to think? First, if it is a cold, from cold, initially it will be cold. So you have to preheat it, right? So when do you preheat it? After a certain duration of time. So that time has to be set. What should be the temperature for the preheating? So it, should it be the maximum? No. For preheating, it is just about 20% of the expected temperature. Okay. okay. If that 20% is uh, achieved, then the preheating is set. Now you can start the uh, operation or you can send the, uh, you can make sure that the component could be sent on the belt or the conveyor belt. So that is the initial setup. Okay. Then you have conveyor startup. So on normal control, conveyor startup sequence is initiated. So startup will be initiated. Okay. So what will happen during the startup? There are three uh, in initial position. That is the motor position one, two, and three. If it is one, then the tilt of the belt is taken to be as uh, 0.5 feet per minute. And uh, for speed 2, which means it has to reach about 1.5 feet per minute. For motor position 3, uh, which is set normal. So until unless the motor uh, speed is set to normal, which is re reaches about 1.5 feet per minute, until then you are not allowing the component to lay on the belt. Okay? So if the conveyor fails to reach the desired speed within 30 seconds of the conveyor is stopped, and the conveyor fault signal is asserted. So initially, as soon as you start the conveyor belt, okay, to initially there will be a heating, okay, the 20% has to be reached. After the preheating, what happens? The speed of the belt now has to be optimum. So it has to be set well within 30 seconds of the initial startup. If it is not set, okay, which means there could be some breakdown in the, the entire process. So what will happen? You have to restart or you can say that there should be an alarm set up saying that sorry I was not able to start within 30 seconds. There should be alarm that has to be uh, buzzed out during that process. Okay. Normal conveyor speed is 8 to 10 feet per minute. So if at any time the speed drops below then uh, alarm should be as asserted. So what do you mean by that? So whenever you have a normal functioning of a belt, the conveyor belt, the speed has to be set. The speed is taken about 8 to 10 feet per minute. So that is the, the feet length, the belt, conveyor belt, how many feet has to move along with the, along the motor, right? So 8 to 10 feet, if that is the desired speed of the conveyor belt per minute, okay, if the speed is lesser or greater than 8 to 10 feet, then there should be alarm. Okay, and it should be aborted. The entire process has to be aborted because if you try to place even a small component, it might not, it might not get uh, preheated. It might not get dried up. It might not get even cooled at the required temperature. Okay, 
So that's the reason you need to have an alarm which should be asserted. Now after that the temperature monitoring. Temperature monitoring for every two seconds of monitoring of temperature uh, there should be 5 percent variation of temperature should set an alarm which means that for every two seconds there should be alarm that should be set. In or how do you have the temperature monitoring system there? For every two seconds there should be a monitoring system because it's about the component and the crucial element is about the temperature and the speed of the belt, right? So for every two seconds you have to monitor the temperature, right? Now if there is an error, okay, if the temperature varies, okay, if I say even about 5 percent, there should be an alarm that should be set. Okay. okay, PID controller algorithms are used, it is mainly as the uh, proposed date of uh, uh, integration, integral and uh, different de derivatives uh, controller that is you know uh, the PID controller algorithms are used here and uh, the why they are used because it is most uh, advantageous and the most convenient way of uh, setting up and measuring and controlling the entire system. Okay. So convey a failure, if there is any failure in the system, reset command to be used for closing the whole system. So there should be a reset, so re make sure that the entire system is stopped and it will be reset and it starts from the beginning. Okay? Reset command to be used for closing the whole system and restart causes the conveyor to restart the whole cycle. The whole cycle will be repeated if it is a restart, if it is a reset the entire system has to start from the beginning. So conveyor pause, it is a blockage during the components moving on a conveyor belt, then it could be immediately stopped or it could be paused. Okay? So pausing is nothing but it is just a, a temporary halt okay, till the clearance of the blockage. Stop command to turn off the heater and the conveyor. Stop command, will what will it do? If you give a stop command, the entire heater and the conveyor belt completely stops. Guards are unlocked and display lights turned to green. What do you mean by that? So as soon as the entire operation is stopped, okay, when you have a stop button, then the heater will come, it will be off and then you have the conveyor belt will stop and then the guard which will be there on the either end what you see here in the diagram, correct? So that will be uh, disabled in the sense it will it will go low. If it is zero, what will happen? The indicate entrance and the exit both will be set to green, which means that the conveyor belt is not moving. Okay, it is completely halted. So this is all about how a, a complete uh, co component gets dried in a simple drying oven. Okay, now coming up to Ward and Miller method. So there are what you call it as essential models. What are the system requirement? Is what is stated in essential model. And the starting point is to build from the analysis of the requirement a software model uh, representing the requirements in terms of abstract entities. So initially when you start with the essentials you always go with the abstract model, correct? The required in order to design the model, okay? Then it has two important parts, one is called an environmental model, other is called as a behavioral model. It is very very important to know and understand what do you mean by environmental model and the behavioral model? Okay? In simple uh, statement, we can just say that environmental model is system being model. The entire system is being modeled based on the environment. Next, if you have behavioral model, how the instrument is designed in order to behave for the particular environment. So it is about the internal structure of the system. Next, coming to the implementation model. Uh, how the traceability from the physical system to the abstract specification model. So now from the essential model you have another called as the implementation model. So essential model is mainly to what has to be designed, correct? Or what are the system requirements? And next implementation model is how you are going to have the traceability of that physical system based on the, the plan that you have set, based on the abstract. Okay. So that can be explained with the help of simple block diagram here. So the entire abstract model will be divided into two as you see, first is called as an environmental model, other is called as a behavioral model and it is simple uh, description of an environment. This gives a description uh, of the uh, instrument or you can say the, uh, the entire system, the internal structure of the system. Okay. Environmental model can be 
based on different kinds of context diagram and the listing process. So it mainly has the context, what kind of context diagram it has, a description of boundary specification or boundary separation, uh, the system from its environment. How, what are the boundary limits that has to be adapted for any kind of a system? So that becomes the context of diagram for an environment, okay, environmental model. Then you have what is the event list, what kind of description that you are going to add into. So the description of external events in the environment to which the system must respond. So based on the external temperature, pressure, humidity, how will the system respond? That will be your event list. So this entire things come, to, come under what is called as environmental model. Okay. What is a behavioral model? In a behavioral model, it mainly focuses on the internal structure of the system. Right? So first it would be the transformation schema, how will a system transform itself towards the environment. So under that you have a description of action taken by the system in response to the event. So if there is any uh, uh, variation in the environment, how will the system respond to it? So that becomes the internal application of a system towards the environment. So that is called as a behavioral model that comes under the transmission schema. Then you have data schema which means a description of the information the system must have in order to respond. So what kind of data it has to have as a information for which a system will respond to the external environmental condition. So the entire behavioral model again uh, it is actually broken down into transformation schema and the data schema. So this is mainly to respond as how a system will respond to the external environment based on the internal structure, internal data that has been uh, that is available and that will be designed, correct. What about the environmental, what are the boundary limitations of the environment condition where for which the system will be designed. So this is two different modeling which are very important. So we shall learn about it in the next coming classes. Thank you.